Good day. I'm Patrick Ryan, the editor-in-chief of uh, Sutras.com, and we're here in a special edition of Focus KSA with Dr. Theodore Karasik, Director of Research and Consultancy at uh, Enigma in uh, Dubai. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time today, Dr. Karasik, to talk briefly about uh, the situation in the region, Iraq, the saudi US relationship, and uh, some of the current developments in, uh, in the kingdom and, uh, and the region. Uh, thanks for joining us. Can you um, can you start us out with uh, your assessment of what's going on uh, in in Iraq with the crisis, with the advancement of e ISIS, and uh, and what the impact of that is for uh, the region, uh, for the United States, and for uh, Saudi Arabia? The advance of ISIS in Iraq has clearly caught everybody by surprise, given their ability to move so quickly on the ground, and that is because uh, they were able to gain a foothold in Al Ambar by making deals with uh, the local tribes on the ground there, and also with uh, what we are calling Saddamis uh, forces, and also with uh, others who have been affected by Amaliki's government and his governing style because the Sunni populations have basically been cast off to the side. Uh, currently now there's about 100,000 men in this group uh, that ISIS seems to be leading and they have definitely captured uh, key nodes of uh, Iraq in terms of their uh, desire to find infrastructure, factories, and so on uh, so that they can add to their emerging state or caliphate. Uh, what this means is, is that once they've captured these areas and attempt to hold them against Iraqi forces, they're turning their sights onto expanding in other directions. And those directions clearly are um, looking at uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, for example, and also Kuwait, who just went on full military alert uh, within the last 24 hours. Uh, for the United States, this is posing a tremendous uh, challenge uh, because not only of trying to support Maliki back in Iraq and at the same time trying to get the prime minister to make important political changes in the way that he governs, in terms of the um, in terms of trying to find a way out of this problem to get Sunni Iraqis into government and to feel more part of the system, uh, but also is uh, how the U.S. is viewing what's happening in Jordan uh, and the desire to protect the Hashemite Kingdom against any ISIS onslaught. Uh, which occurred uh, and was attempted over the past uh, few days. And then, of course, with Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia is the key, uh, according to some people, in terms of halting ISIS's advances. So the United States has a lot at stake here. It involves three or more countries that are in the immediate path of ISIS, and the group is moving very quickly, almost too quickly, for American policymakers to uh, come to the uh, appropriate decisions that need to be made, and therefore the U.S. is ever reliant on Saudi Arabia and Jordan uh, to come up with the answers. Now, you, you referred to uh, Saudi Arabia as being the key and uh, the United States uh, policymakers. Uh, trying to uh, keep up with developments there. We've also uh, uh, got uh, the concern of what has been called a widening gulf in U.S.-Saudi relations uh, over the last uh, months and uh, looking back to last fall. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the relationship? We had President Obama out there in March. Uh, Secretary Kerry was uh, recently uh, there for consultations with the king. What's what's your sense of the state of play of the relationship? Are, are the Saudis and the Americans on the same sheet of music? It appears from what uh, I've been picking up from where I sit in Dubai and talking to officials uh, throughout the region and including within Saudi Arabia, 
that the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. is not particularly healthy. Uh, when President Obama came to uh, the kingdom in uh, March, uh, this meeting was extremely short. It featured no banquet. It had no ceremonial sword dance. Uh, this was a time when King Abdullah basically lectured the president about uh, the relationship and what was happening in the region. And uh, this did not play well with the Saudis at all. Uh, then we had uh, Secretary of Defense Hegel come over and uh, for the ministerial in Jeddah. And uh, this also didn't seem to go very well, too. Um, after that meeting, uh, of course, we had uh, Secretary of State Kerry visit uh, the kingdom. And uh, the way that it's being reported, at least among colleagues, is that um, Kerry talked a lot and uh, the Saudis listened, but there was really nothing new there uh, for the kingdom and the security elites to grab onto. And so there still seems to be a disconnect. The kingdom feels that uh, America has uh, uh, is a major part of the problem uh, that originated with the uh, occupation in Iraq, then with the failure to follow through in Syria, and now it's back to Iraq and the problem with ISIS is just spreading. So what can America possibly do uh, on behalf of uh, Saudi Arabia? So it seems that Saudi Arabia wants to step up to the plate a little bit more. How do you see that uh, playing out in the, uh, the near term in formulating a policy uh, to counteract what's, what's going on in, uh, in Iraq? And a lot of this has to do with the relationship with, between Baghdad and Riyadh and uh, the United States um, trying to get uh, uh, change in, in Iraq uh, to become more inclusive as, as sort of a longer term solution to the problem. But in the near term, we, we've got to uh, uh, make sure that uh, the United States, Iraq and Saudi Arabia uh, are working together to counteract what's going on in, in Iraq in, in the short term. It strikes me that Saudi Arabia, who is not very supportive of Al-Maliki, and Al-Maliki has already ridiculed Saudi Arabia for ISIS, uh, they're not going to agree to much of anything. I think that uh, the kingdom is going to have to come up with its own policy in dealing with ISIS, and um, that is probably forthcoming in, in the next few weeks. Um, in regards to uh, working uh, with the Americans, uh, Saudi is going to perhaps, as I mentioned a moment ago, try to make a step forward. Uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, some individuals argue that the kingdom's uh, foreign policy in this regard is broken. Uh, that there is um, too many voices and not enough action. Uh, frankly, uh, the process is uh, one that is going to require a lot of work in order to step forward. Other people are arguing that uh, the process is in place, uh, but that there needs to be a someone at the top who can help guide this, who knows ISIS very well. And that is why we're very interested in looking at the appointment of Prince Bandar bin Sultan as a special envoy on this matter. We, uh, we've we seen in recent days uh, the reemergence of uh, Prince Bandar, at least in terms of the official announcement that he's an advisor to the king. As well, we've, uh, we've seen the uh, the move of uh, Prince Khalid uh, bin uh, Bandar from the Deputy uh, Defense Ministry position to Director of uh, the Chief of uh, the Intelligence uh, uh, Department in Saudi Arabia. Can you comment briefly on on uh, those moves and, and what they mean uh, in terms of both the Iraq situation and the relationship with the United States? I think it's clear that the Saudis wanted to make sure that they have uh, capable people, if you will, to deal with this issue in the short term. Um, and uh, Bondar's return 
is critical uh, because of, um, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, he, he's, he knows ISIS very well. Uh, Bandar bin Sultan has returned to the scene uh, early last week uh, when he uh, was with King Abdullah in Cairo uh, with the brief meeting with President al-Sisi. Uh, after that, uh, Prince Bandar uh, was back in Riyadh uh, and uh, King Abdullah held or chaired rather a session of the Saudi National Security Council, uh, which uh, we have not seen very much of. So it seems to be that this council has be, been reactivated uh, specifically for what's happening in the Levant and particularly with Iraq. Um, so it's interesting to note that Bondar who is accused of setting up ISIS in the first place, uh, is now being put in this position. And the interpretation is, is that uh, he's the one who made it, so he's the one who has to fix it. If he does not fix it, and there are a lot of people who don't think he can because ISIS is out of control, uh, that uh, this may be Bondar's last political appointment. Having said that, the appointment of Khalid bin Bandar uh, to the head of Saudi intelligence filled a gap uh, after uh, the dismissal of the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, after uh, 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 Prince Mugrin moved out of that position. And uh, so now we're beginning to see uh, a, that a royal who has excellent lineage, who is tied to uh, King Abdullah uh, visa his father, Bandar bin Abdullah Aziz, uh, is going to be in charge of figuring out uh, the intelligence requirements and the reporting needs that are necessary to help Bondar bin Sultan make the moves that he needs to do. However, having said that, there is likely to be a clash between the two because one prince is offsetting the other in terms of the ISIS question. So uh, this will be very interesting to see how this plays out in policy. Great, we've been talking with uh, Dr. Theodore uh, Karasik, uh, Director of Research and Consultancy at Enigma. Uh, Ted, thanks uh, for that. And we're gonna continue our conversation uh, offline and we'll be uh, sharing uh, that transcript with, uh, with our viewers. Uh, separately, uh, but for now, uh, this has been Focus KSA, a uh, production of susurus.com and susdig.org. We invite our viewers to go to susurus.com slash Focus KSA for these uh, recordings and, and others and the transcript of uh, our complete conversation with Dr. Uh, Theodore Karasik. Ted, thanks again uh, for your time. Thank you.